Good morning. I'd like to call this meeting to order. My name is Ann Aiken. I'm the um, acting designated federal uh, officer for NVAC. Um, we'll just go ahead and get started today because we do have quite a few good presentations coming, but I do need to go through a couple of rules of engagement. Um, first, this is a public meeting. It's being recorded and all statements are on the record. Second, this advisory council is governed by the Federal Advisory Committee Act, or FACA for short. FACA provides rules about the circumstances by which agencies or officers of the federal government can establish or control committees or groups like this one to obtain advice or recommendations. The voting members are special government employees and are therefore subject to conflict of interest laws and regulations, as are all members who work for the federal government. These members previously provided information about their personal, professional, and financial interests. Um, the liaison representatives are non-voting members of the advisory council and are not subject to the same FACA rules as the voting members. Additionally, the information provided at this meeting does not necessarily represent the official position of the National Vaccine Advisory Committee or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Mention of products, processes, uh, services, manufacturers, companies, or trademark does not constitute endorsement by um, or recommendation by the U.S. government, HHS, or NVAC. So with that, I would like to proceed with um, roll call. Please respond verbally when I call your name. Robert Hopkins. Present. Melody Butler. Tim Cook. Present. John Dunn. Present. Jeff Dushin. Chris Arisman. Present. Lynn Friedland. Present. Good morning. David Fleming. Good morning. Present. Good morning. Dan Hoft. Molly Howell. Here. Good morning. Jewel Mullen. Present. Good morning. Stephen Rinder Connect. Hey, good morning, present. Good morning. Rob Schechter. Present, good morning. Good morning. Winona Stolzfus. Good morning, present. Good morning. Bob Swanson. Present. Good morning. Uh, Devin Plott. Present, sorry, good morning. Good morning. Claire Hannon. Present, good morning. Good morning. Rebecca Coyle. Present. Good morning. Uh, Jean Good. Here, good morning. Good morning. Meredith Allen. Good morning, present. Good morning. John Douglas. Uh, present, good morning. Good morning. Carrie Robinson. Hannah, oh, she's not here today. Uh, just, just not here today either. Uh, Christine Ashansky, Melinda Wharton, present. Good morning, Mary Beth Hans, present. Good morning, Bruce McLenathan. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, Jay Slater, present. Good morning, Mary Rubin. Good morning, present. Good morning. Uzo Chukwama. Good morning, present. Good morning. Barbara Mullock. And Troy Knighton. Hi, Ann, I'm here. Good morning. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Hopkins, our chair. Good morning. I wanna thank all of you for, who have joined us in person and online for our June NVAC meeting. I want to once again thank you, Anne, for getting us started uh, and to the, the NVAC team for its work in planning this meeting and supporting the committee throughout the year. Also want to thank the NVAC members and subcommittee members for their dedication to further the work of this committee. Welcome to the second day of our first in-person meeting since the COVID-19 pandemic. And for those watching or participating online, I'd like to welcome you as well. I look forward to the presentations and discussion today and will provide my perspective on highlights from yesterday, as well as an overview of our agenda in a moment. Let's start with a few housekeeping items. 
In terms of housekeeping, I want to make sure that everyone's aware that this is a public meeting and it's being webcasted on the HHS website. For our virtual members, please mute yourself when not speaking, and please don't use your camera unless you're presenting, asking a question, or answering a question. If you'd like to speak, please either raise your hand or send me a chat through the online platform. For our in-person members, you can move your nameplate to stand on the short end to notify me that you'd like to speak. Please use the microphones when speaking so everyone can hear you. During the discussions, I ask that all members and speakers identify themselves before speaking if I didn't acknowledge you by name and giving you the floor. This helps the note taker and others to follow along. As always, members of the public can provide a public comment by phone today at 2.15 p.m. Public comments are not a question and answer session. They represent an opportunity for individuals who'd like to do so to make a statement. The deadline for requesting a space for public comment during this meeting has passed. However, anyone can submit a written comment up to three pages in length to NVAC at hhs.gov. Now let's go through a few highlights from yesterday. After our welcome, we were greeted by Admiral Levine, who's a staunch supporter of our efforts to effectively protect individuals in our communities by immunization. Our experiences through the last two years of the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us what we can accomplish in development and implementation of a new vaccine and novel vaccine platforms while also revealing challenges in vaccine confidence, uptake, and equity in our society. Dr. Levine has charged us to work to develop two critically important reports. The first, assessing and providing guidance on vaccine innovation, and the second, to assess and support further development of our vaccine safety systems. Our panels provided us with information on a number of topics relevant to the vaccine innovation charge. Innovations in immunity to address the needs of subgroups and comments on prioritization. Innovations to support personalized immunization of individuals with the promise of genomics to help target the best and the safest vaccine to best support individual health. We heard presentations on four developmental vaccines for poverty associated diseases. And finally, panelists discussed the complexity and lessons in the pursuit of an HIV vaccine new adult hepatitis B immunization recommendations, and injection-free inoculations, as well as the investigation of severe hepatitis in children. Finally, John Dunn up, uh, updated us on the current recommendation statements from the Vaccine Confidence Subcommittee, and we'll be looking forward to continuing to work through uh, that report. For some brief highlights for today, we'll start our day with a panel on easing cold chain considerations. After a short break, we'll hear from experts on COVID-19 vaccine safety, the monkeypox vaccine, and improving it representation in clinical trials. After lunch, we'll receive updates from federal agencies and liaison representatives. We'll conclude with another opportunity for public comment. Finally, as a reminder, please hold the next meeting date on your calendars. Our next meeting will be September 22nd to 23rd, 2022. And please refer to the NVAC website for the final details on upcoming meetings. At this time, I'd like to start our first panel of the day. Our first panel is easing cold chain considerations. As immunization programs expand, the role of the supply chain to ensure vaccines are available when and where they're needed has become an even more critical issue. This session will explore some innovations to improve the cold chain distribution. Our first speaker will be Julie Swan from North Carolina State University, speaking on the process of distributing cold chain vaccines more effective, efficient, and equitable. She'll be followed by Anna Nagurney from the University of Massachusetts Amherst on innovations in infrastructure, and will be followed by Johnny Robertson from PATH, speaking of vaccine vial monitors and freeze prevention carriers. Uh, Dr. Swan, uh, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Your slides are up, you're loud and clear, you have the floor. Thank you so much. I am delighted to uh, be able to speak with you today. I wish I could be in person, but um, we will go this way. Uh, and as mentioned, I'm going to be talking about efficiency, effectiveness, and equity related to distribution of vaccines. Next slide, please. Let me start with an overview of a supply chain in general. This year, we know more about supply chains than ever before, unfortunately, because of shortages and other kinds of things. They govern our lives on many different products. 
when we look at the supply chain overall, it's an interconnected system. You often have decision makers who have autonomy, who are making their own decisions, and we have systems that help us manage product flow, information flow, movement of people, money, other kinds of things. A typical goal for a supply chain would be to deliver the right product at the right place, at the right time, to the right customer, at the right cost. And sometimes, of course, there are modifications of that uh, in a public health system. In a public health uh, supply chain, you have a number of other entities that come in, including your health departments, pharmacies, uh, doctor's offices, hospitals, places of employment, and many different groups that may represent our demand in this system. I'm going to talk a little bit about efficiency, effectiveness, and equity, and I thought it would be useful to define what I mean by those. So uh, next slide, please, and then the next slide after that. Thank you. Um, efficiency, what I mean is that the supply chain is operating quickly or economically, so we often look at measures like speed and cost. For effectiveness, we're interested in whether we're doing the right things in our supply chain. So outcomes might relate to the percentage of people covered, the safety, uh, even health outcomes themselves, preventions of cases, hospitalizations, or deaths. Equity can mean many different things. Here, I'm going to use the definition where we use resources to meet differing needs in the population. The picture on the right is an illustration of Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, but what we also mean is that some people are at greater risk of hospitalization or death or greater risk of exposure, and that this is taken into account along with thinking about the population as a whole, either geographically, race, ethnicity other kinds of measures. There are often trade-offs between any of these three measures or even others across our system. So we may not always be able to be uh, the highest efficiency and the highest effectiveness, and we have to make decisions on which things are more important for a given event or product. Um, and let's go to the next slide, please. Equity is particularly important when you take into account people have differing health conditions, which may put them at greater risk for severe outcomes. And of course, they may also be in jobs where they may have greater exposure, such as if they are frontline workers um, versus ones who may be able to telecommute. This is a picture of diabetes prevalence across the United States by county, and you can see just as one measure that there are also geographical differences in uh, uh, health conditions across the population. What you can also have is that when vaccine hesitancy comes in, different kinds of populations may have different reasons for hesitancy, and that combined with reduced access to vaccine or providers can mean that issues related to equity can be compounded across a network. In addition, because the reasons for hesitancy are wrong, we may need different solutions to personalize those for different subpopulations. Next slide, please. This is a picture of vaccine outcomes related to H1N1 for the pandemic. Uh, please click twice. Um, we did some studies and looked at what factors, particularly factors across the supply chain, were related to higher coverage, especially during the time period when states had limited supply of vaccines. So we found a number of things, including if there was a shorter lead time from when you were allocated vaccine to when that vaccine was shipped out the door, and there are a lot of things that are going on in that, in that back end, but if that lead time is shorter, then it was associated with higher vaccine coverage. We also found that states that sent vaccine to locations with broad access like pharmacies or clinics had higher uh, uptake, and if they waited a little bit longer to open up vaccine to new eligibility groups uh, for the prioritization that was done during that campaign. In other 
studies, we also found that the system can benefit from visibility across the supply chain, which we often have in a lot of industrial uh, commercial supply chains, but which, which is more difficult in the public health system, but that you can allocate um, in ways that can improve your effectiveness and your equity. Next slide, please and click uh, three times, please. If you look at the supply chain system in early 2021, um, there were a number of challenges early on, uh, especially when thinking about trying to uh, meet the national objectives that have been set out both by the NASM group and by uh, the various plans in place. And many of these are problems that I would consider to be classic across supply systems where you may have demand and uncertainty, supply variability, difficulty in forecasting, poor information visibility, decentralized decision making, competition, uh, speed, inventory, a number of different things. What we also know is that there are strategies and innovations that can help these supply systems operate more effectively. So certainly looking at stable supply, increased supply, which did have happen over time in 2021, having good data systems and good technology and infrastructure, having information sharing in place, centralizing information so that it's not only out in different pockets um, and a number of other things, including a portfolio of products, in this case, vaccines and needles that can meet different needs. You can also put in place incentives and performance measurement, which can also drive the kinds of decisions that you want across the supply chain and align the decisions across the supply chain. And the other one I mentioned there called pooling, uh, this would be a way of um, gathering the information on the demand in a particular network so that you're making sure you allocate a limited resource uh, in the ways that meet your objectives. Uh, click, please. Next slide. Going back to that overall supply chain, if you look at the middle part of the supply chain first, and this is the one that we may initially have thought of when creating the vaccine, and there's some really great successes here, significant achievements in developing new vaccines, reviewing, approving them, manufacturing, and having a portfolio of vaccines that have arisen over time. There have been major improvements in these supply chain systems since the H1N1 pandemic pandemic response, especially in this midstream, in this middle part of the supply chain. There are successes in data systems, timing of actions, reducing lead times, and even the cold chain infrastructure itself, especially related to storing at ultra-low cold temperatures for the vaccines uh, we've been using this year. Next slide, please. Now let's go back up the supply chain a little bit and look at uh, what we would call the upstream part, where we are thinking about the raw materials, the supplier of components. We certainly have seen that there have been some challenges in these, especially as you think about ramping up a system um, for products that were largely lab and research-based previously to ramping them up to millions and billions of doses. And I would say that we continue to have challenges across the upstream of our supply chain, not only for vaccines, but for many other other products. And in fact, we have many supply chains that are vulnerable, um, supply chains that provide us with critical medical products that are vulnerable, also ones that provide consumer goods and, and food items that are vulnerable. And some of these products really are critical. Uh, innovations that can help address this. One is to have better visibility of the potential problems. Uh, we don't really, across um, all of the different entities involved in these supply chain systems, have a good sense of what the capacity is uh, for each of these items and where the bottlenecks or gaps are that we need to address. And we want to design our supply chain systems so that they are robust and resilient to disruptions and can bounce back. And right now, um, there need to be continued innovations in this space. Next slide, please.
On the right-hand side of this supply chain is the downstream after the manufacturing of the vaccine and really what we sometimes call the last mile. So it's left a distribution center and goes on a truck and then may go to many different places, sometimes to a warehouse within a state, more often to specific providers, hospital locations, pharmacies, clinics, employers, all of these different uh, locations. Many supply chains have a difficult last mile, especially in emergencies. And there are many aspects of it that are difficult, and certainly including the ultra-low supply chains, uh, the sizes of the shipments in some cases. We, there have also been a number of successes in this space and a lot of improvements and innovations made, especially since the H1N1 pandemic. Next slide, please. Some of those successes, the uh, prioritization strategy that was laid out in July of 2020, the speed and timing and coordination of decision making and really having that standardization was an innovation that was important both for the cold chain and wastage as well as for the overall efficiency and effectiveness. The utilization of pharmacies and large hospital providers uh, that could run uh, big mass clinics uh, uh, was important. The cold chain infrastructure that was added, especially in distribution centers and in transport, was really important. And we do have now more cold chain in place, ultra low cold chain in place than was there before. Uh, some uh, public private partnerships uh, that are working, some data systems have improvement. Click, please. There continue to be some opportunities, and I would include data systems in that as well, and data sharing, and there are many examples where our data could be improved and we can make decisions in ways that improve efficiency, effectiveness, or equity. The ultra-low cold chain does put additional requirements that make it difficult to uh, distribute vaccines safe to, safely and effectively, both in the United States and worldwide. Um, certainly, there's a trade-off here between the speed of development, and, and that was also crucial. What we have seen is that a portfolio of vaccines uh, with different cold chain requirements can be really important. I mentioned shipment sizes, shifting roles and responsibilities. There was a change in prioritization midway through the process. Uh, that did, we have studied that and found that um, the uh, that did lead to some differences in equity. There were also some challenges and continue uh, to be challenges with respect to thinking about allocating a limited supply when you have priority groups. We've all heard of examples where vaccine was brought to a location, perhaps to reach lower income populations, and then people who had resources and time called around, took a number of uh, appointment slots. And there are various innovations in the data systems and infrastructure that can help make sure that that vaccine is uh, reaching the intended audience. And this is particularly true early on when supplies are most limited. That did contribute to some challenges initially around equity, uh, along with data in the system and not having good ways to really measure equity across the entire system. Uh, I think there continue to be opportunities for public, private, and academic partnerships bringing in folks who have supply chain expertise, data systems, information infrastructure, and other types of um, uh, innovations, and then uh, trust in the system and the role of information, misinformation, and disinformation, I think will continue to be important not only for these products, but also on many going forward. And we really need to rethink what we're doing with respect to information. Next slide, please. In terms of Reducing inequities, um, we have studied and found that prioritization during this pandemic of frontline workers can reduce the inequities and still have good performance in terms of mortality and morbidity for the overall population. A balance of uh, targeted distribution while ensuring physical access, both through mass clinics and through mechanisms that allow people who don't have a lot of transportation or mobility that can also uh, help to improve the prioritization. 
more data collection and more data sharing. On the top right, there's a graph of completed vaccination by race and ethnicity. It's incomplete because not all states are tracking that information. And right now, publicly, there is not information on what that looks like for, say, the population 65 and over or for working age adults. And there are many cases where when you put measures in place across a supply chain or another kind of system, then it can drive behaviors. So that's another reason that these data systems and data requirements are really important. There have been a number of innovations on decision support and visualization. On the bottom right are some colleagues of mine at Georgia Tech that developed a dashboard to, uh, to promote and visualize equity uh, with respect to race ethnicity for the Departments of Public Health in Georgia. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the portfolio Portfolio of vaccines that have differences both across the cold chain and other aspects. Next slide, please. So one other, um, I think, really important question is, uh, given all of these things that we've seen and learned, are we ready now? But have we learned and really internalized that and made decisions differently? And so I, I pose the following scenario. Suppose that, uh, let's say, in the fall, we have a new variant with high mortality and we need a completely new vaccine that is in limited supply initially. Or it could even be a different disease, whether that's uh, monkeypox or a different one. I am expecting that we've addressed some of the challenges, but there will be an, a number of them that we will see repeating themselves in this kind of situation. The role of information and communication across the network and increasing uptake and belief in safety. I think that we have global supply chains that continue to be at risk, uh, have vulnerabilities and are not fully resilient. Um, I think that we would find that in that time period, that initial time period with very limited resources, resources and excess demand, that we would have a lot of challenges that would manifest at that last mile area. And there are uh, innovations that we could put in place with respect to data and information systems that would help, um, especially related to prioritization and ensuring that we're meeting our goals with respect to equity across the system. I think that we do need continued advancements in data systems and data sharing, and that that would also be evident from a scenario scenarios such as the one that I mentioned. And a final aspect, if you look at all of the different advisory committees that perform these really important functions, I think that they um, they could additionally benefit from supply chain experts who really think about supply chain systems, not only for their given entity, um, but really across the entire system to help improve innovation and uh, operations for the future. Click, please. Uh, and, you know, there are a number of different areas where, where these relate uh, and where investments and continued work uh, is needed. Next slide, please. That is the end of my slides, uh, and I will turn it back over to the chair to determine uh, next steps. Thank you very much, Dr. Swan. Uh, we will now move to uh, Dr. Anna Nagurney from the University of Massachusetts Amherst on innovations and in infrastructure. Dr. Nagurney, your slides are up. You have the floor. Thank you very much. It's a great honor and pleasure to be speaking with you today. I'll be taking you on a panoramic journey of the kind of research that we've been involved in pre-pandemic and also during the pandemic. Uh, my presentation will focus on supply chain networks, labor and resilience. And also I'll be talking a lot about perishable product supply chains because vaccines are clearly a perishable product. Next slide, please. I would like to dedicate this presentation to all the essential workers who have kept us safe throughout the pandemic, uh, all the healthcare workers, many of you in the audience, obviously the food service workers, farmers, and even educators and freight service providers. Uh, really, really important to acknowledge their fantastic work. Next slide, please. I work on the modeling of network systems, and I've seen that networks have been actually a theme for the past two days. 
Uh, I work on interaction of different types of decision makers and users of network systems. And I work on predicting what are the flows, what are the profits, what are the costs, who might win and who might lose. Now, uh, some of these systems are very, very complex. For example, congested urban transportation networks, the internet, various social networks, which we've been hearing a lot about, and also supply chains, which is the major topic of what I'll be discussing today. Next slide, please. So much of my research has focused on supply chains. Supply chains we've seen and heard about have been disrupted in a major way in the pandemic. And now even with the war against Ukraine, they continue to be disrupted. So understanding them and their behavior and how to make them more resilient is absolutely critical. And uh, the approaches that we use are, we use operations research, we use network theory, and obviously data science and algorithm development. And once you have developed these rigorous methodological tools, it's fabulous because you can do all sorts of sensitivity analysis, scenario analyses, and so on. Next slide, please. So I believe in writing books. Uh, not only do I do a lot of research on supply chain networks, but one of my areas of expertise is disaster management. And clearly the COVID pandemic is a healthcare disaster of global proportions. You'll see that most of my books do have a network theme, and uh, this is something I really, really care about. Next slide, please. And the approach that we take to studying perishable product supply chains is multidisciplinary in nature. That's extremely important, okay? I tell my students, you need the chemistry, you need the physics, you need so many different subjects that you're learning or have learned about to do accurate modeling. So for example, in terms of perishable product supply chains, we've done a lot of work on blood and actually our work on blood supply chains and our writings influence national policy, which we're very, very proud of, We've done work on medical nuclear supply chains, another very stressed kind of supply chains, and also work on uh, many different kinds of pharmaceuticals and vaccines, which are perishable. Next slide, please. Now, if you use a network approach, I think it's very, very powerful because it's graphical. And many decision makers, policy makers, they respond to visualization. So, for example, in our work for the American Red Cross, you can see the different tiers associated with the supply chain, you know, from the donations to the testing, the storage, uh, the last mile distribution, and actual final use. At the same time, you can see in terms of medical nucleotides, you know, used for cardiac diagnostics and also for cancer diagnostics, the different kinds of tiers that are involved and associated with the links, we'll have different kinds of costs, we will have perishability, there might be risk, there might be time elements and so on. So we typically use tools of optimization very, very powerful. And also, as we're hearing throughout here, you know, there is competition. Throughout the pandemic, we've seen, you know, vividly the competition. Competition for PPEs, competition for vaccines, competition for workers. So it's very important to use the proper methodologies. So we also use game theory. So here you'll see, for example, multiple pharmaceutical firms or multiple vaccine manufacturers competing for each other. And they still care about maximizing profits. It's extremely important to capture their behavior. Not everyone is a nonprofit organization. Okay, so we're interested in figuring out what will be the deliveries of the supplies, what will be the costs, what will be the prices, okay, what if we have different capacities, what if we have limitations, what if there's risk, what if there's some disruption to the infrastructure, which we're seeing increasingly now with climate change and uh, the escalating number of all sorts of storms and other kinds of disasters. Next slide, please. So something else that is really important, and when we talk about perishability and the cold chain, including the ultra cold chain, we care about preserving quality of the vaccines. That's imperative. Whether we're dealing with food, right, with pharmaceuticals, with vaccines, you have to preserve quality. So a book that I wrote uh, with a former PhD student of mine, Don Michelle Lee, talks about competing on supply and chain quality. 
And we've seen all sorts of instances of quality failures in the pandemic, including in terms of vaccine manufacturing. And this is something I know you're well aware of, but I think it's very impor important to emphasize that, that quality has to be preserved. It's a matter of trust also of the population, of those who will be getting the vaccines. Uh, we need to make sure that we can maintain the cold chain throughout the pathways, you know, from the manufacturing sites to the eligible distribution sites, and do that not only regionally, nationally, but also extremely important globally. Next slide, please. So you see, when we have different kinds of supply chains for different kinds of vaccines, different kinds of pharmaceutical products, uh, we abstract them as networks. And you can see then the similarities or differences across different kinds of topologies. And when it comes to modeling quality, you have minimum quality standards. And that's really important to preserve. You might also have information asymmetry that sometimes happens with manufacturers, right? You might not have all the information. Uh, you want to make sure that the quality is preserved also in terms of transportation. Now, some of these vaccines travel very, very far. Uh, the different components also in the processing steps, there were many, many miles between the different kinds of steps. So it's really, really important to preserve the quality because we are living in a supply chain network economy. Okay, I have to emphasize that. And also, when you look at the different kinds of topologies, what we're interested in identifying, what are the most important nodes and links? Obviously, those are the ones that you should be investing in and protecting. We can't just have a single manufacturing plant now. If that goes down, everything goes, you know, uh, belly up. And that's something really, really important. By having supply chain network models, analyses, algorithms, and prescriptive and predictive analytics, we can build more resilient supply chains to save lives and preserve our economies and societies. And that's extremely important. Next slide, please. So here, we've been hearing about all sorts of fabulous innovations, right? And we expect to see more when it comes to vaccine production, dissemination, and ultimately injection. But no matter what happens, we're going to need different components for vaccine manufacturing. Okay, and this is something that we've seen throughout the pandemic. You know, uh, we are going to need probably some sorts of injectables, right? You need the vials, you need the inputs in the, into the production process and so forth. So we need to be able to trace out and map where these different supplies, you know, all the necessary resources are coming from. You know, do we have any in, you know, maybe politically sensitive locations around the world that we're seeing. We're dealing with heightened geopolitical risk. It's extremely important as a nation to make sure that we can guarantee the supplies that we need, that we have, you know, enough redundancy, we have enough su uh, supplies, you know, we can deal with the capacities and so on. Right. Next slide, please. So something I've been completely obsessed with and I'm writing a book on now is labor and supply chain networks. We've done all sorts of, you know, wonderful engineering innovations, technological innovations, modeling innovations, and so on. But really, it's all about people. Without people, we have no R&D. We have no manufacturing of vaccines or essential critical products. We have no transportation. We have no storage, we have no delivery. So it's critical that we include labor as a very, very important resource in all of our supply chain models. And that's something we've been heavily involved in throughout the pandemic. Next slide, please. So we published a series of papers, and as I mentioned, I'm now doing a book on it, uh, to identify both in optimization and game theory uh, frameworks the impacts of disruptions to labor. And that has to do not only with supply, but also with productivity. 
We've seen that if workers work too long, they get too tired, right? We see if they don't have, you know, safety feelings in their environment, they're not going to be as productive. So it's extremely important to include those kinds of parameters and then to identify where should the investments be so that the labors continue to be productive. Where should we invest so that we have sufficient labor resources to do the production, the transportation, the storage, the final mile distribution, and so on? Next slide, please. So here we did a model where you had optimization, and this was focused on another perishable product, actually, PPEs, and the firm is interested in optimizing, okay? So you're interested in minimizing costs, you're also in minimizing, uh, you're maximizing profits, and you have different kinds of constraints of labor associated with the links. And we actually dealt with three different kinds of constraints, and this is something really, really important. And we've seen in the pandemic, maybe you might be able to reallocate labor resources to different kinds of tasks with some training or uh, maybe even with minimal training because labor is so valued now. So what does that do? What does that do to the availability of these important products? What does it do to the prices and so on? Are the demand markets well served or not? Okay, next slide, please. And also, we considered game theory, okay, to see uh, what happens if you have competition for labor resources and also for different kinds of demand markets. So, for example, a firm might have bounds of labor associated with production links, transportation links, storage, and ultimate last mile distribution. Or, say, you had a labor constraint associated with production. And the firms are competing, right? Because, you know, high tech is so important now. Expertise in vaccine manufacturing is so important. And firms need those labors. Or what if you had a certain volume of labor available in the supply chain network economy and they could reallocate who would win, who would lose, what would be the profits, would the consumers be served in a good way or not? Next slide, please. Okay, so what are some of our findings? And this is really, really important. A lack of labor on a single supply chain link, even in a freight service one, okay, can have major negative impacts on supply chain network product flows and prices. And we've seen the congestion in the ports. We've seen shortages of truckers and so on. And this is really, really important. Supply chain networks, their systems, they're not just two node, one link networks, okay? They're complex, okay? So really important to have that graphical kind of representation. Also having appropriate healthcare pandemic mitigation processes and procedures in place is essential to continuing operations. With even one manufacturing plant closed, we're seeing that in terms of baby infant formula now. The prices can rise at the demand markets and you will not have the availability that you need. Okay, also reduction in labor availability can result in a significant increase in product prices at the consumer level, again, stressing the importance of preserving our workers' health and well-being. And even in the case of reduced labor availability, however, having alternative distribution channels can be extremely helpful, okay? Finally, having the flexibility of you know, labor being reallocated to different tasks across the supply chain network uh, can enhance profits and also the availability of important products for consumers. Next supply chain. Next uh, slide, please. So uh, how can we make things better or stronger? How can we uh, analyze the performance of our supply chain networks? Uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote a book that I thought co-authored with Patrick Chang, which is kind of prescient, fragile networks, identifying uh, vulnerabilities and synergies in an uncertain world. So here, we're really interested in figuring out which are the most important nodes and links? What if one supplier goes down? Which is the most important supplier? Do you have an alternative? It. How will it impact the supply chain network economy? Okay, and it's really important because supply chains, you can have different kinds of tiers. Okay, so you might not even be aware of how important a particular supplier is to your vaccine production, for example, until something goes wrong. 
you have to prepare. You have to do these kinds of analytics. It's imperative. Okay, so, and then uh, that was focused, the book, uh, primarily on critical infrastructure. And now we've gone and extended the work to include labor. Okay, next slide, please. So in a paper that was just actually made available and fully published this morning, uh, we present measures for the resilience of supply chain networks to labor disruptions. And that has to do with disruptions in labor availability and also in terms of labor productivity. So you can then figure out where the investment should take place to maintain the efficiency and the performance of your supply chain network. So we've done it in an optimization framework, then extended it to the case of a game theory framework, and that's a chapter in a forthcoming book on defense critical supply chains, and clearly vaccines and pharmaceuticals are defense critical supply chain products. Next slide, please. So uh, the supply chain network efficiency measures for networks with labor and associated bounds uh, are, you know, we construct them and we have associated resilience measures that identify then the impacts with respect to disruptions of labor availability and productivity disruptions. And what we're finding is that if we can have free movement of labor across the supply chain network, we get higher efficiency. Okay, so we need that kind of agility and flexibility for these critical products, which vaccines are, as well as a higher resilience. Okay, also a reduction in labor productivity can impact the supply chain network efficiency and the corresponding resilience. So we must be investing in the health care okay, and the productivity of our workers. That's essential. Now, it's all about people. Okay, we have to be supporting each other. We have to take care of our workers and one another. And also, a, uh, so the reduction in productivity can affect uh, resilience in a very negative way, as well as um, the availability. And uh, interestingly enough, we found that the presence of electrical commerce escalates the efficiency of a supply chain network, but diminishes its resilience, which I thought was kind of, you know, interesting finding. Next slide, please. So I'd like to thank you for listening. I posted this presentation on the Virtual Center for Super Networks website, where we have a lot of materials, a lot of our articles, lectures, podcasts, interviews with the media, and so on. And I thank you all for your great work, and I'm deeply honored to be included today and in speaking to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nagarni. Our next presenter in this panel is Joni Robertson from PATH. She's going to speak on vaccine vial monitors and free pre freeze prevention carriers. Your slides are up. You have the floor. Thank you so much. <clears throat> it's great to be here in person. And I want to appreciate um, Drs. Swan and Nagurney for their great presentations. And I think this builds well on that. Um, I know that there are some on this committee who are very familiar with PATH. Um, it seems Seattle is well represented here, um, but just for some who are not familiar, um, we are an organization with more than 40 years of experience working in global health, and our work has always been focused on increasing equity um, in access to health with a global lens and working particularly in low and middle income countries. We focus on tech technologies primarily, and currently our work spans the areas of product development, health system strengthening, vaccine development, health information systems development and implementation, epidemic preparedness, and importantly, advocacy and communications, which is crucial for building the policy and market environments needed for PATH's work to thrive. We're headquartered in Seattle, Washington, and we're home to more than 1,500 employees worldwide who work across about 30 different offices around the globe, and our projects touch more than 70 countries. Currently, about 58% of our staff are located outside of the U.S., and a vast majority of us 
our nationals in the countries where we work. An important aspect of our work at PATH is the multidisciplinary approach that we use. Our teams include scientists, engineers, public health practitioners, business specialists, health economists, epidemiologists, etc. We even have some medical doctors on some of our teams. <laughs> um, and we're also well known for our public-private partnerships. We have built our success through working closely with private sector partners to advance technologies that will benefit public health. PATH is never the long-term manufacturer of the technologies that we develop, even the ones that we develop in-house, but we are always transferring technologies to producers who can put them in the markets that we want to serve. So today I am gonna be focusing on cold chain technologies. And I would love to talk about all of these technologies, um, but I'm gonna focus on the top two. And I've left a little bit of information on some of these other, other technologies and some links so you can access the presentation I understand after um, this meeting. Uh, we also have recently been focusing on cold chain equipment maintenance. Um, along with colleagues from JSI and Village Reach, we have an initiative to make maintenance sexy. And we'll see, <laughs> we'll see if we can get Gabby to bite on that one. Um, okay, so moving right into vaccine biomonitors. So the vaccine biomonitor is a technology that's incorporated in the label of a vaccine. And it's important that it's at an individual vial level. And if you look at the, um, the graphics across the bottom of this slide, you can see how it works. There's a white square. And at the beginning, at the beginning it starts with a white square and a purple circle. And as the vaccine or the vial is exposed to heat over time, that square gradually changes color until it matches the background color, at which point that means that that vial has been exposed to the limit of heat that it can handle. And then it, the square will continue to darken, but basically the discard point is there when you have a match in those colors. Um, let's go on to the next. This is the timeline for the work that PATH has done with the temp time VVM. And a few things to note here, one is the long time that it takes to develop technologies. And until the COVID vaccine came along, uh, we always are expecting 10 to 20 year timelines for technologies that we're working on at PATH. So you see that we started in the early 1980s, having conversations with an organization or a company that had a time temperature indicator that they were using for food product. Um, we were interested in its application to vaccines. Um, temp time was spun out of that company. And then we worked together, PATH and temp time, um, did some field evaluations in the 1990s with uh, oral polio vaccine. And to prove the concept, um, WHO and UNICEF came on board and said that this technology should be used for all oral polio vaccines. Um, polio, that vaccine is one of the most heat labile vaccines in the low and middle income um, childhood vaccine portfolio. Uh, finally, Gavi came on board and said that this, um, this technology should be used with all of the vaccines that they support. Um, and FDA approval also in the mid 2000s. So you can see it's sort of a long process and it involved not only the technology itself, but proving the technology in um, its context of use and then getting policy um, leaders on board to, um, to advocate for this technology as well. Um, an important point about the VDM is that it is still currently a um, sole source. Tim Time is the only company in the world that's producing this technology at this time. There have been a few companies that have brought forward technologies. And up to this point, TempTime has acquired those, tech, those companies. And there's still some technology or some companies that are, have some pipeline products. And we're really hoping that we get another WHO approved product. Um, as Dr. Nagurney mentioned, it's super important to have um, diversity in the manufacturing and the sourcing of these technologies.
and we've currently um, passed the 10 billion mark for VDM. So t over 10 billion VDMs have been supplied to manufacturers for inclusion on vaccine files. Um, as you know, vaccines have vary in their temperature stability. And so there are different uh, VDM types. Um, they all are basically following the Arrhenius equation. So you have um, a mathematical explanation for how reaction rates occur um, in temperature and time. And then so you can scale up or down the rate on those curves. And we started with the VVM2, which is used for OPV. For a long time, we just had 2, 7, 14, and 30. But as you can see, when new vaccines come online that don't match, um, it is possible to generate new VVMs to match the thermostability of the vaccines. Oh, this is an old vaccine. <laughs> Sorry for the... Uh, for the note there. But anyway, benefits to uh, management and handling. Um, the best benefit for this is just the comfort that it gives healthcare workers, that they can look at a vaccine vial as they're delivering it and they can know that it's potent in terms of heat um, stability. So you have the expiration date that's always there. If you can look at that vaccine vial monitor, it's an instant visual cue of whether you can use that vaccine or not. Um, it enables policies such as the multi-dose vial policy, which is a WHO protocol that allows um, the use of multi-dose vials. You can open them and then keep them in the refrigerator for up to 28 days, as long as they have preservative. Um, this really decreases vaccine wastage, of course, um, but VDM is a critical tool that is part of that protocol. And similarly, the control temperature chain is another WHO protocol that allows us to remove vaccines from the cold chain altogether at the end of, the, of their life during the last mile delivery. So depending on the vaccine, we have three days for HPV right now, um, 14 days for oral, cholia, oral cholera vaccine. Um, and so these vaccines can come out of the cold chain. They can go into a box without any ice they can be kept in um, ambient conditions, which are monitored to make sure that they don't exceed 40 degrees. And it just really um, eases the, log the logistics in the last mile. Um, another advantage when cold chain breaks do occur, for example, on a large scale, if you have a hurricane or earthquake and you have wide scale power outage, um, so you can't just take vaccines down the street to another refrigerator. Um, you may have multiple days of um, cold chain break. And with this technology, rather than discarding tens of thousands of vaccines, you can see whether uh, it really did um, reach the level of heat exposure that it needs to be discarded. And many vaccines do have quite a lot of thermostability. And then finally, just managing stock on hand. A nurse can look in a refrigerator and very easily see where her vaccines are in terms of exposure to heat and use the ones that are more exposed um, earlier. So like we have first in, first out policies, you can use a VVM, um, the level of VVM exposure as a tool for stock management as well. So quickly on one more technology from PATH, um, this is a freeze preventive vaccine carrier. And we do spend a lot of time and energy trying to make sure that vaccines are kept cold enough. But in fact, um, there are a lot of vaccines that are very susceptible to freeze damage. And freezing right now is an invisible um, condition for um, in a vaccine carrier. And in fact, looking at a value um, level, 1.2 billion out of UNICEF's $1.7 billion procurement of vaccines on an annual basis are free sensitive vaccines. So the newer vaccines, more expensive vaccines tend to be free sensitive. So the traditional vaccine carrier is more like <clears throat> a carrier, like you would take a six pack to the beach. Everything goes in the same compartment. You put your ice and you put um, your vaccines. And what happens, depending on the temperature that you freeze your ice packs and whether or not you condition them, which is a procedure where you lay out your 
um, freezing packs. You take them out of the freezer and let them reach basically a melting point. Um, and if you don't do that, but you put everything from deep freeze into the vaccine carrier with the vaccines, you definitely will be reaching freezing temperatures for a number of hours. And this is a kind of worst case scenario. This is a minus 25 freezer. So you often have freezers that don't quite get that cold. And this is also a colder ambient temperature. This is a 10 degree C um, ambient temperature. But even at warm temperatures um, and less efficient freezing, you would have temperatures say minus five for several hours in a, um, in a container without conditioning. And so by separating the ice and the vaccine, and this sort of looks like simple plastic separation, but there's a little bit of technology in those barriers. There's some um, insulation, there's some liquid phase change material layers in there. And by doing that, you can maintain temperatures above zero, even if you take um, ice packs directly out of the freezer and put them in. Um, and this is helpful for health workers um, who don't need to then take the time and planning to get uh, their ice packs out of the freezer early and let them condition. So it just eases against the logistics. So I think that is it for me today. And thanks very much. Um, it's been a pleasure to be here and I'll hand it back to the chair. Thank you, Dr. Robertson. Are there any questions or comments from the members here in the room? John, please. Hi, this is John Dunn. Uh, I wanted to thank all of you for this. These were really interesting. I, and I'm glad that it's something that we're doing. Uh, we, we tend to focus a lot on the vaccines themselves and, and how they work and what they do. And, and as I'm becoming increasingly aware, all of this other stuff plays such a huge role in that the, uh, that I think often gets overlooked. I, I just had one question with regard to this very last presentation. Um, uh, these, uh, the, the two devices that you talked about, um, it's uh, obviously are, are developed and primarily intended to be used in, in parts of the world where, where this is a real, real challenge. The truth is even in, even, even in parts of the U.S., even in standard practices, if these ever got to a point where they could be mass produced enough and cheap enough, um, to be used uh, in general practices, they could they could conceivably have a lot of benefit because it would decrease a lot of errors, decrease a lot of waste, make a lot of things a lot easier than they otherwise are. Is there is there any realistic thought that that either or both of these things could be eventually uh, efficiently and cheaply enough produced for that to be a realistic future? Can you hear me? There. Okay. Um, so the quick answer is yes. And actually the, you know, Path really is focusing on low cost technologies because our market is low and middle income countries. The vaccine biomonitor um, is purchased by the vaccine manufacturer. And so of course the cost comes then in purchasing the vaccine. And it requires the buyers really to demand that technology. So by UNICEF saying, we won't buy this vaccine for our, for Gavi funded vaccine, unless it has a VVM that drove, that's what drove the VVM production. And I'm sorry, I don't have the cost per unit on that, but it's not huge. And I think that Canada, I'm not sure if Canada has done it, but they certainly were um, advanced in discussions about um, requiring the VBM as well. So it's something that US Department of Health and Human Services <laughs> could perhaps do. And then again, the vaccine carrier is um, a product. I think in Dr. Nagurni's slide, she showed that slide that had the, um, the source or the location of the different products. And she listed some European um, sources for vaccine carriers. But the vaccine carriers used in Gavi supported and low and middle income countries are not coming from Germany. They're coming from China and India. And I think that the vaccine carriers, probably the freeze free 
vaccine carrier produced by Indian and Chinese manufacturers that PATH works with is, you know, might be less expensive than what's being used in the U.S. right now. Um, so. Great. Thank you very much. And our last uh, question or comment is from Tim Cook. I, I had a question probably most directly related to Dr. Swan's talk, but I'm just wondered about a thought experiment where instead of the mRNA COVID vaccines being requiring really low temperature storage, if they were just normal, like two to eight degrees, do you, what, what do you think the uptake would have looked like? In ter let's just say in the U.S., because it would be very different in different parts of the world. But, you know, in the U.S., do you think the coverage rates would have been different or would it, they have been less equitable, or, or did we just deal with it? And, and there were so many other factors, they probably look pretty much the same. So I do conjecture that there still would have been questions about a vaccine for a novel virus. Um, for the H1N1 pandemic uh, vaccine, it was traditional egg-based manufacturing in 2009. We make influenza vaccines every year, so there was not much different with that one on a number of different, um, for a number of different reasons. I do think that we would have seen some uh, vaccine hesitancy, but not as much. Um, and I think that it could also have been different for different subpopulations because there are different concerns, whether it's questions that people have had about fertility in women or about whether there is tracking in the devices, you know, just lots and lots of different things that are that are out there that are not true. Um, it could have um, had higher uptake both here in the United States and in some other countries. You think based on the, I'm, I mean, really based on the temperature storage alone, I mean, everything else being equal, do you think that would have made a difference? So the temperature storage alone, um, it certainly could be challenging, particularly for rural areas or for places, even within cities, um, urban deserts where they didn't have a large pharmacy chain, a large uh, hospital provider, a large um, uh, a Publix, as we know, and some. So it could have been higher, particularly timing-wise, could have been higher January, February, March, because I think what eventually happened is that many state and local health departments, along with their partners, found ways to reach those communities using mobile vans, mobile nurses, other types of things, but it took them longer to get there. And so um, having, you know, and, and even Moderna had lower cold chain uh, requirements than Pfizer did and could last longer. Um, and, and so once Moderna was available, that helped some. Um, so I do think that could have helped to reach some of those populations, but it also has to be really intentional. And, and it was intentional on a number of fronts around the country, but really has to be intentional and address the various kinds of reasons for low uptake. And, and access is one of those that cold chain contributes to that, but there are others as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Can I just add a couple of thoughts on that? <clears throat> I think even, if access is the same, there's a cost involved in keeping things at ultra low. And there was a time cost for sure in low and middle income countries. And as Gavi was preparing, um, they really had to put up an ultra low infrastructure. Although by the time that, because there was so much delay, then the, um, the less temperatures sensitive vaccines came online. Um, but there has been a lot of money spent on the ultra cold chain in the Gavi countries as well. But I think also, if you think about, um, Dr. Swan talked about, this is a system. And one of the aspects of getting a vaccine so quickly to market is that you don't have that temperature data yet. And as you saw over time, even Pfizer stepped down their, um, their temperature storage requirements because they have the data. Um, and so if you want a vaccine to go out as soon as it's been produced, you kind of are stuck in the situation where it has to be ultra cold for a little while. Um, and you have a cost associated that's sort of the whole cost of getting this vaccine out so quickly. 
want to thank the members of this panel uh, and thank all that are on the call virtually as well as those that are here in the room. We're now going to go to a break. Uh, I have 10.09 Eastern Time. Uh, we will re reconvene at 10.15 uh, for our next panel, COVID-19 Vaccine Safety Review. Thank you for joining us for our June NVAC meeting. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.